One question about about one of the um, settings on on the on mainland on, the, on in Japan itself. I guess this is a question about where you place the temple the, on on Mount Shiranui in terms of large, medium, and small history. This right. is a, a key setting in the second part of the novel where um, the main female character is taken against her will and it's a, it's a rather dark and strange place. Where did that come from? Uh, my sick, fevered imagination. Uh, yeah, I made that up mostly. No, no, that's not fair to, uh, to Shintoism. I made it up completely. Um, however, uh, that part of the world, sort of the southwest of Kyushu, historically, is, is, uh, is a, uh, was sort of a terra incognita. Uh, incognito? Incognito? Is it incognito? You're, not, you're an educated man. Trams. Oh, tra Streetcar trams? No, okay. no, no one? No. <laughs> uh, behave. Um, is, um, and uh, so, yeah, there's a convenient blank space on the map. Um, it was unexplored until quite late in the yeah, 19th century, really, uh, m middle of the 19th century. Uh, and it's a sort of a, well, um, I can't answer your question too much without giving away any spoilers, really. Um, shall we move hastily on? Sure, we can, we, can, we can skip yeah, yeah. and they can uh, encounter it and enjoy it for yourselves, for sure. Um, I guess I had, I had one, one, one sort of final question, and it's that uh, throughout your career, you've been, you've been praised repeatedly for the, the, the dizzying structures and the intricacies of your novels. Um, but in a recent interview with Wyatt Mason, the New York Times Magazine, um, you spoke of your interest in human mud, which uh, doesn't strike me as immediately intricate or, or particularly um, complex. So I was wondering if you could just tell us about, about your sense of human mud and how that, that concept figures into your writing about um, I, don't, I don't know too much about your own personal life, but uh, either a past or present partner. Think about your relationship with that person. And uh, is it a straightforward, simple thing? Or, or is it a more multifaceted and subtle and complex and shifting and evolving? many times more than any kind of simple novelistic structure you could ever compose. Uh, I suggest, I mean, I, I, I would politely suggest the answer is probably that. Mm -hmm. It's much more, it's a, uh, one single relationship, sort of infinitely rich and puzzling and fascinating and wonderful when it works and miserable when it doesn't. Um, yeah, um, at some point, some, some point, probably my early thirties, mid thirties, became a father. Sort of, um, okay, I have a relationship with my wife. We got the kids. We're kind of stuck with each other now, at least for a while. Uh, need to work things through. Um, you think about uh, human mud becomes more interesting when you age, uh, and it made me aware that there's probably a spectrum of writing which goes from muddy to hygienic. Uh, hy the hygienic end would, 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 have, would have someone like um, Haruki Murakami. Uh, and when he's good, he's very, very good. Um, and, and this isn't a better or worse thing. It's, it's just his books happen to be generally devoid of messy, tangled relationships with your mum. And, and she didn't, and it, it sort of, you know, and, and, and uh, whereas at the other end would have, say, um, Marilyn Robinson, um, it's almost nothing but sort of the tectonic shifts, the, the slow evolution, the evolutions, the sudden the <coughs> Joyce-like flashes, it, it's, it's human mud. She does it brilliantly. And, and, and it's even the books of home, housekeeping, it's, it's, it's domesticity. But uh, she sort of finds the infinity and the, the Emily Dickinson's a great example. Never left a room. It was, it was nothing but washing up and washing clothes. And her life must have been... But she, you know, she finds the universal in it. Um, she's a bit of a digression. We got this spectrum. Uh, when I was 
in my 20s or early 30s and thinking, yeah, structurally dazzling. I like the sound of that. Uh, I'd sort of <laughs> go for that. But now mm, I'm sort of moving, moving along the spectrum towards the, Mar the Marilyn Robinson end. Yeah. But it's, it's wonderful mud you create on that end, let me say. Um, the Wyatt Mason interview in the, the Times Magazine uh, introduced me to a new critical term, which I didn't know, which was um, Mitchell Geeks. Are you, are you familiar <laughs> with this term? It sounds a bit arrogant, but I, I, um, if you read a feature on yourself, it's sort of like a, a diary gone haywire. <laughs> when suddenly, oh my, oh, oh, stop, stop, <laughs> pen. Uh, so uh, I didn't actually read it. I'm, I'm, I'm really glad that the, that the attention was there, but, uh, but, I, so, but this is all new to me. Right, well, the, the, author, um, the author of the piece makes note of the intensity of admiration that you can inspire in your readers, and he describes some of these people as being quote unquote Mitchell geeks insofar as they are so intensely invested in your work that, uh, that they've formed a tribe in and of themselves, which is my way of transitioning to reader question. <laughs> hey, 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 he's smooth. Uh, well, if, 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 if you ever hit hard times with the uh, writing, Randy, which I'm sure you won't, then a career in broadcasting is waiting. Thank you very much.